Good afternoon and welcome to Conservative Conversations. My name is Jessica Anderson and I'm the Executive Director of Heritage Action and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our call this afternoon. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome our guest, Congressman Ken Buck, who will be joining us from the great state of Colorado to talk about his time as both a legislator and the author of a new book, Capital of Freedom. Congressman, thank you for joining us today. I'd like to tell our guests um, a little bit about, about your background. Sir, you serve uh, in Congress representing Colorado 4, which covers the eastern part of Colorado, but you're also the, the chairman of the State Party for Colorado and the author of a new book, uh, the new book is titled Capital of Freedom, and we're going to spend some time today talking specifically about that uh, and some of the issues that are at stake. So with that introduction, let's just dive right in. Um, I'd like to begin by first reflecting on some of the current events that we see uh, overtaking our cities. In recent months, there's been a steady escalation of violence by left-wing activists in our cities. Um, these are cities not just Portland and San Francisco and Chicago, but in smaller cities as well, up and down the East Coast, in the Midwest, in the Far West, including several cities in Colorado. So you've spent a long time in law enforcement as a prosecutor. And so I wondered if you could give us some thoughts and reflections to what's going on now and what we've seen recently with the uptick of the violence. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me that uh, liberals think that it's a good idea to defund the police or to reduce police services at this time um, uh, of violence, really. And, and uh, I don't know whether they think they're going to call a social worker when someone breaks into their home. I wouldn't advise it. Um, and, and I think that uh, the, the folks who are most at risk are the constituents of those who are making these policies. And uh, those of us who live um, out in the country uh, we have guns, we can protect ourselves. The, the folks in the cities have been stripped of their guns already and uh, are, are really at risk for the kinds of, of silly uh, circumstances that come when, uh, when politicians think they know better and, and can reduce mm -hmm. police forces. You know, sir, with everything that's been going on, I was reminded that several years ago at another point of tension between the left and our law enforcement, our police officers, you actually were on the front lines of this and you wrote the liberal governor of Colorado at the time and asked him to light up the state capitol uh, in Colorado to show support for Colorado's police, something as simple as lighting it blue one evening. So what has changed that now no Democrat elected officials are really taking a stand against the lawlessness? You can't even see them supporting the police. You have Joe Biden or Kamala Harris talking about reimagining and retooling our police force. I mean, this is, this is rhetoric around defunding the police that is quickly becoming policy. And, and, it's, and it's silly in a lot of ways. I, I, I think when uh, they try to blame Republicans or President Trump, I was part of the Tea Party movement in 2010. We had plenty of protests. We didn't spray paint the Capitol. We didn't uh, tear down statutes. We didn't burn down uh, fast food restaurants because a violent act had occurred there. Uh, the right um, is engaged in protests and there are some peaceful protesters, but there are plenty of uh, violent anarchists out there. And, and it's true, uh, Joe Biden can't stand up and uh, be honest and say that uh, these violent protests are uh, are really hurting this country, and, and the idea that we're going to somehow cancel our culture is is really uh, an idea that uh, I guess it's necessary for the left to get to their socialist uh, end goal, but it's mm -hmm. uh, at the same time it offends most Americans to to think of uh, tearing down statues and uh, and really denying those that have made this country great. That's exactly right. And, you know, sir, I want to thank you also for committing to support the police, in particular, in recently signing our police pledge, which calls on all elected officials at the local, state, and federal level um, that we will not support any bill, resolution, or movement which seeks to defund the police. And you were one of the first House members that got on this pledge, and, and now we've seen um, dozens of your colleagues follow suit. And I think that's an important inflection point for elected officials at whatever level they serve to be very clear that between the anarchy um, and peace and safety and security stands that thin blue line and behind them 
backing them up are the American people, elected officials who want to just let law enforcement do their job to keep us safe, to keep us secure, and return the peace to the streets. So thank you for, for making that commitment. Um, and we certainly applaud your colleagues that have done that as well. So your book, I'd like to turn our attention to that now. First off, I don't know where you find the time. Uh, I think it's just awesome uh, that you've been able to, to do this. And Capital of Freedom is a really meaningful perspective um, that I think is our, our viewers and Heritage Actions Network will, will really enjoy learning more about it and reading on their own time. And I, one of the things I love the most about the book is that each chapter is framed around a certain piece of history of our nation's capital. So what are you hoping readers will learn from your book as they dive in to Capital of Freedom? Yeah, I think it's important that uh, folks understand that we have symbols of freedom in the Capitol. We have symbols of freedom all over D.C., all over the United States, and we've got to celebrate our freedom. There, there certainly is a, a strong argument that could be made that uh, our founders were flawed individuals, and, and the reality is that we're all flawed individuals. And so uh, to not celebrate the, the gift that our founders gave us, the gift that uh, so many have sacrificed for over the centuries for this country is a mistake. And, and I wanted to point out the many uh, historical features of the United States Capitol and talk about uh, those, the constitutional principles behind those features and then also talk about how wrong the left is and where they're trying to take the, this country and, and how uh, a member of Congress, a progressive member of Congress, walks by all these features on the way to the House floor when they cast these these flawed votes. You know, your book actually talks about that specifically. I, I want to uh, draw everyone's attention to a story that's in the first few pages of your book. And you're telling the story about the impeachment vote, about um, the time that we're around it and how Democrats walked right past La Lady Liberty. And they walked right past her uh, to cast that impeachment vote of President Trump. And, you know, Lady Liberty is supposed to remind us of our duties to the Constitution. Um, and they were seeing that image literally as they were, they were casting their impeachment vote, which is a very powerful contrast that you draw in, in the opening of your book. So can you tell us a little bit more about maybe some of the other artifacts that might be lesser known, um, and then specifically how those guide you as a lawmaker today? Sure. Well, let's just talk about Lady Liberty for a second. Um, I was impressed. Uh, my orientation to Congress in 2014 included a dinner uh, in Statutory Hall, and uh, one of the House historians was there and pointed to Lady Liberty, a statute over uh, the floor, what used to be the, the floor of the House. And so you can see the plaque where Abraham Lincoln sat and the plaque where James uh, John Quincy Adams sat. Uh, you could see all uh, uh, and get the feeling for just how important this particular room is. And then later, Liberty is uh, handing a scroll down, uh, and the scroll is the Constitution. And she's saying to the members of the House, don't forget the Constitution when you vote. And mm -hmm. as I walked to the impeachment vote, I looked up and I looked at that uh, scroll and I thought it's too bad that we don't have a symbol like that on the current House floor. And maybe it would have influenced some of the Democrats to, to do that. But many of those same progressive Democrats walked by uh, that scroll, that reminder, as they went to vote on, on really what was a sham impeachment and, and a disgrace in, in American history. One of the other things that is a theme um, throughout your book, and certainly as your time as a legislator, is fighting back against um, some of the extremism of the left. And right now, we really see this um, coming to a head, not just with law enforcement, but with this revisionist history and rewriting history. And it's really become more or less part of progressive ideology. So how do you see that unfolding in today's day and age? And then the second question would be, what do conservatives do about it? So one of the features that uh, is prominently displayed all around the Capitol is the Latin uh, term, e pluribus unum. And, and uh, you can see it um, in the, uh, the 50 stars on our flag and the, and the 13 stripes. And you can see it um, in, in so many uh, different ways that, that we are a, a, a country that is made up of a very diverse population. And at the same time, we come together as Americans. 
the, the socialists need to divide us as Americans, and they can't, uh, they can't uh, uh, countenance our constitution um, or the rules that we play by. They have to change those rules. So they have to cancel history. They have to deny history. They have to change the language in the constitution, either through the courts um, or uh, just denying uh, what it meant. They have to try to demean our country in ways that uh, uh, they can try to divide uh, different groups and, and have groups fight against each other. And, and I think that uh, one of the things that we, we point out in this book is that it's so important to, to maintain our focus on being a unified people and being a United States, not just the states are united, but the people are united in this country. And if you go through the Capitol, you'll see over and over um, how we are uh, united and the symbols of unity that, that are there. So is unity what makes America so great and, and the path forward of how we reclaim that greatness amidst the backdrop of some of this violence right now? Well, unity is certainly an important feature. There, there are other features. Our, our uh, American exceptionalism is based uh, in large part on the fact that we have religious liberty and we have this freedom of speech and we have the ability uh, to, uh, you know, to, to question our government and our leaders. And uh, I talk in the book about the fact that the, the Capitol was built on a hill mm -hmm. and Article One of the Constitution is the, the first article and is meant to really focus the people's attention on the most important branch of government. It's the government. It's the branch of government that's most accessible to the people. So you've got a, a, a capital on a hill, and then you have the mall uh, where uh, peaceful assemblies were encouraged to uh, make sure that the people could speak to their uh, legislators. And so the whole concept of American exceptionalism, I think, is bound up in the fact that government serves the people. And, and not the other way around. You know, your books, sir, really just couldn't come at a more meaningful time in America's history where we see the, the statues that are being torn down in places across the country. We obviously see the destruction from the riots and the violence. We see the left wanting to defund the police. And just today, you know, you pick up the, the paper here in Washington and you see that the D.C. mayor um, wants to rewrite our history, our artifacts. So can you, can you shed us light on what's going on uh, in our nation's capital that they may want to remove something as symbolic as the Washington Monument? I mean, this is, this is directly flies in the face of our American history. And, and certainly um, there's a way that we can look at history to find answers to, for how to deal with these problems today. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me. You know, Washington, D.C. Uh, was, was meant by the founders and really by most of us that, that work there to be a neutral site. Um, it, it was meant to be a place where Republicans and Democrats could come together, where the people could uh, uh, address their grievances with, with the government. It was, it was not meant to be a, a partisan battlefield. And, and this mayor uh, is turning Washington, D.C. into that kind of partisan place that it was never meant to be. And having given uh, the, the government of D.C. Um, great latitude in how uh, the government um, uh, delivers services to the people of D.C., it's really gone, gone too far. But when the mayor talks about uh, removing uh, national monuments on on park property. This is in DC. This is United States park property. Right. Uh, just, just a crazy concept. And unfortunately, uh, I don't know if she's planning on running for something else or, or what her agenda is, but it really, uh, it, people around the country are really questioning uh, why uh, the mayor wants to, to do that. And again, it gets back to the fact they have to dismantle our history in order to change the history in a radical way. That's right. And the, the fight for America and our values, our institutions, our culture, what we believe um, and hold dear, that's both historical, but also forward looking, you know, really couldn't be more clear or spelled out in the fights of today. And so, sir, I, I want to thank you for this book. I think it's poignant. I think it's timely. It's something that all grassroots conservatives that love America 
love our institutions, our constitution, the artifacts, everything that makes this country exceptional, um, need to spend the time to read. And then even more than that, to articulate uh, the history of America to our friends and families. We know that it's not just conservatives who vote, um, and it's not just conservatives that make this country great, and all, all of us can recognize uh, the power of this great country. And I think that's nicely spelled out in your book, Capital of Freedom. So any last words for our Heritage Action grassroots membership today? And, and we'll send you back on your way in the great state of Colorado. Well, first, I want to thank Heritage Action for the, the great leadership that, that you have in, in terms of this fight over the police issues and in, in restoring um, our history. And I, I think it's really important that uh, people get to Washington, D.C., and they get to see uh, our history firsthand. And mm -hmm. when you have events at Herod in Action, I would love to give people a tour uh, of the Capitol in the evening. And, and whether they buy the book or not, I'm happy to, to uh, make sure they understand all the neat features that, that are present in the United States Capitol. Well, we'd love to take you up on that, sir. And we have plenty of people that I'm sure would love a tour and, and to see history through your eyes. So thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon. Thank you for all of your hard work representing Colorado and, and really doing the, the diligent work of uh, advancing conservative policies here in Washington. We know it is not easy. Heritage Action has your back. And we just want to say thank you again. Thank you. That's it for Conservative Conversations and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.